Hi everyone, welcome back to the episode of Ask Dr. Nick. My name is Dr. Nick Schmulkoffer and I work for the Neurologic Wellness Institute. And today's question is a pretty simple one, but a very difficult one to answer. And that is, what is the best treatment for dystonia? And I'm gonna say right now that there probably is no best treatment for dystonia, um, but I wanna go through why that is. And so dystonia is a disease, a disorder, a neurological disorder, a lot of times it's genetic, but could have environmental components or probably does have environmental components, can also be caused following concussions. And what happens is uh, the person, the patient's muscles start to become, have abnormal movement, abnormal tone. And so most commonly dystonia is going to be um, in the cervical spine. So you can list it as a cervical dystonia. Um, and that cervical dystonia could be sustained, like holding off to one side or like holding like this, where it's twisted. Um, or it could be more tonic, where like the neck is moving constantly. Okay? That's the most probably common is cervical dystonia. But you also have like a hemidystonia, where the abnormal sensation, abnormal movement is on one half of the body. Uh, you could have a task-induced dystonia where it only happens in certain tasks like running, like a runner's dystonia. You could have um, a like specific dystonia where it's more just, it's like a hand dystonia or a typing. Uh, writer's cramp is a form of dystonia. And so um, there are many types of dystonia and it really kind of depends um, on the type for the treatment and it really depends on the individual that uh, the patient is. And so when we look at dystonia, we're looking at a abnormal sensory motor processing going on with the brain. And that the brain is causing these movements because it's getting poor sensation, poor proprioception or muscle sensation from that area. And so we need to find a way to show the brain what that sensation should be, what that, um, or show the brain a better chance of what that area, what that map looks like of the brain um, or of that body part. And so let's just go through this paper. It is uh, a brand new paper um, from 2020, and it's called The Neurorehabilitation in Dystonia and a Holistic Perspective. Um, some neurology and preclinical neurological studies. Okay, and so I just like this paper because it talks about all the other things that are going wrong besides the specific motor or the clear motor problem. So, uh, rehabilitation for isolated forms of dystonia, such as cervical and focal hand dystonia, are usually targeted towards the affected body part that focuses on the sensory motor control and motor retraining. Um, however, people with dystonia experience a range of functional and non-motor deficits that reduce their engagement in daily activities and health-related qualities of life uh, and that they should be addressed. And so that's what this paper is looking at. We're not just looking at the specific motor component. These findings support need a holistic approach to rehabilitation of dystonia where the assessment and treatments involve these non-motor signs and symptoms. Um, so most studies that investigate is cervical dystonia, again, it's more common, um, is evident that reduced postural control and walking speed, a high fear of falling in actual falls, and there's visual compensation for the impaired neck posture that happens, and then a myriad of these non-motor symptoms, such as pain, fatigue, sleep disorders, anxiety, depression, um, can all affect individuals with cervical dystonia. So again, that's why a holistic approach is best. And so as we kind of go through this, right, dystonia is an involuntary, sustained, or intermittent muscle contraction caused by abnormal postures, repetitive movements, tics, or tremors. The most common treatment medically is for cervical dystonia is a botulinum toxin injection or just a Botox injection. Um, and that generally just reduces the uh, tone of the muscle, may help with pain, uh, but it doesn't actually fix the underlying issues. Rehab issues are generally neck related that reduce the activity in those contracted muscles and maybe enhance the strength and function of the opposite muscle, the antagonistic ones. 
So what we've seen here is, and what this article reviews, are these like physical function and gait and imbalance issues that happen with dystonia, specifically like postural sway abnormalities, um, problems with gait, like slower gait, or um, even having to have more feet control on the uh, as you walk. Um, so like how foot reaction time is different regarding um, cervical dystonia and and uh, controls. Here is like gait speed and like single versus double support. So the people that had were uh, cervical dystonia had more double support. Uh, basically, they were more on two feet rather than a single support when walking or walking faster. Um, people with cervical dystonia have more fear of falling than controls. Um, this shouldn't be abnormal because if you don't necessarily know where your neck is in space, you don't maybe trust where you are in space. And therefore, like turning, things can catch up on you faster, uh, things can surprise you. And therefore, it's difficult to be um, able to move slowly through a typical environment, whether that be a city environment or be driving, um, without like a fear of falling or a fear of, of having problems with motor control. Um, vision and function. So people with cervical dystonia exhibit increased postural sway with their eyes open compared to controls, indicating that the vision is a problem. Uh, that's not being used to maintain that center of gravity. Um, there's also been shown that reduced vision quality um, because of like blurriness, tired eyes, eyes not facing um, what they should be seeing with because of the twisted head, they have this predilection, um, can also be issues. Therefore, it can cause balance problems and more of that fear of falling. And then non-motor symptoms. We know that people with cervical dystonia or dystonia in general can, ca can have pain in that affected region can have depression, anxiety, some apathy, poor sleep from, from how they're moving. Um, other things like fatigue, catastrophizing, um, sensory motor disturbances, whether in that area or other places, other olfactory, smell and vision problems. Um, and so, and then of course, like we said here, pain is one of the more common ones, like 55 to 89% of people report pain with cervical dystonia. Um, and because they have these non-motor um, issues, um, it can also affect their ex exercise and physical uh, physical activity, and where they don't exercise because these things make them worse. So here's a good graph showing that. Like most people with dystonia show that um, it may the green is better, the blue is no change, and the red is worse. And so these lighter activities, yoga, Pilates, gentle stretching, light walking. Can generally make people feel better or no change and fewer people get worse from them but as we increase to like some brisk walking jogging running that higher impact can cause um, m more proprioceptive changes more abnormal sensations coming into the brain that is already not doing very well um, and so that can lead to feeling worse so if we look at I like about this picture is all the possible things that could be issues with people uh, dealing with dystonia. So what we see on the outside are these abnormal muscle contractions, fixed postures, maybe a tremor, but there are so many more things underlying the issue um, and so many more things that this person, this individual is suffering from, like sensory abnormalities, pain, fatigue, balance deficits, sleep disturbances, fear of falls, gait issues, vision problems, psychiatric conditions like anxiety, depression, um, decreased self-efficacy. And so this is where when the initial question, what's the best treatment for dystonia? I can't necessarily answer that because everybody is individualized. Everybody's individualistic and everybody has a different type of dystonia. But we do know that these issues need to be addressed. Um, and so what we do in our clinic is we're focusing maybe not on typical physical therapy modalities that are going to try to activate certain muscles and turn off the the one that's not working well, we may be using other ways to activate the brain and get a good sense of where that body part is. But we're also addressing these sensory abnormalities, pain, fatigue, the sleep disturbances all involved. 
Um, but maybe what we also need to do is do some neurofeedback to address some of the anxiety, the depression that could be leading to worse outcomes. A lot of times some stress or anxiety can actually cause the dystonia to become worse. Um, and this is where also talking to a, a therapist can also be beneficial to better control stress and therefore prevent um, worse um, worse movements or, or those bad days. And so these are all something that one education for for patients with dystonia are huge, um, but also addressing all these all these problems like the vision and being able to move eyes properly um, and then make corrections as well. So um, this one to me I, I really like because dystonia is is such a hard um, or difficult case generally. Um, some people respond very very well really fast. Uh, some people take a lot of time. Um, but the idea for dystonia is just recognizing it early enough and not, um, not making it worse by doing a lot of soft tissue, manual muscle therapy, um, a lot of neck movement or a lot of movement with that body part because that can already, that's going to make it worse because already these abnormal sensations with the brain. And so, um, again, I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, please leave questions and comments below. Um, in the future, I can do more dystonia as well because I realize I have not done many of those here on this channel. Um, but if you have any suggestions, please leave them below and I would love to hear them and, and put them forward. So stay healthy and have a great day. Thanks.